Hello, my name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. Georgia in 2021 may not be slave era Georgia of 1821 or Jim Crow Georgia of 1921, but let there be no, let there be no doubt we are seeing a renewed systematic and racist effort to restrict the ability of black voters in particular to exercise the right for which so many have died. But it's not just the 34 or so states around the country that have reacted to the loss of Republican control in Congress and the White House by trying to impose limits on voting hours and voting ID requirements and other, measure, and, and other measures designed to block minority voters' access to the polls with one goal in mind, restoring Jim Crow rules without the overt racism that led to their ultimate invalidation in court. There are other efforts to manipulate the counting of votes by those who persist in getting to the polls through, for example, stripping county election officials of control over the counting. And with the Supreme Court having overturned pre-clearance provisions of the 1964 Voting Rights Act, Voting activists are saddling up once again to make the, what the late John Lewis called good trouble in defense of the franchise. We're joined by five New Yorkers who study, report on, and are active in voting rights issues here and around the country. While we do not have anyone who supports the restrictions, we will try to analyze them as dispassionately as possible. Angela Ledford is a professor in the Department of History and Political Science at the College of St. Rose in Albany. Lorene Daniel Favors is a professor at CUNY's Medgar Evers College and heads the Center for Law and Social Justice, which is a center of voting rights and redistricting studies and activism. Robert George is a columnist at Bloomberg Opinion. Nicole Gordon is a distinguished lecturer at Baruch College's Austin Mark School of Public and International Affairs. That's marks with an E on the end for any of the Twitter heads watching, and a former head of the city's campaign finance board. And Van Goss is a professor of history at Franklin and Marshall College and the author of the recently published book, The First Reconstruction, Black Politics in America from the Revolution to the Civil War, which, which reports on, among other things, the little known and tawdry history of how New York State was the center of political disenfranchisement of free black citizens. As the historian in the group, Van will tell us what it all, what it all means. Let me start with um, Angela. Um, it's argued that we're seeing the greatest attack on the expansion of voting rights since the establishment of the 1964 Voting Rights Act. Is that a fair reading? I think it is a fair reading. I don't think we can overstate how devastating these moves are. And um, we've seen a steady erosion of voting rights uh, in the last several years. Um, certainly the 2013 Shelby County decision that came out uh, that by the Supreme Court with the uh, with the majority opinion written by John Roberts uh, negating the necessity of having preclearance anymore for when uh, states in the, um, the former Confederate states that had a long history of denying access to the vote um, that when they redistrict they would have to have uh, federal preclearance to make sure that those district lines were drawn in a fair way. And that would be and so, here in New York City. That, right. You know, yeah. we to it in New York City. Absolutely. And so uh, in that decision, uh, the, the Chief Justice wrote the majority opinion and essentially said, we no longer need to do this because uh, racial discrimination around voting is no longer um, a problem, which of course we know is not true. Um, and now, as you mentioned, there's a spate of legislation, some 250 laws being proposed in 43 states um, to require voter ID, eliminate ballot harvesting, um, eliminate no excuse absentee ballot access, um, eliminate early and Sunday voting, and of course not allowing uh, poll workers to provide uh, water for folks who are waiting in line to vote. And of course, I, I don't want to neglect the disenfranchisement of the incarcerated and formerly incarcerated in many states as well, um, because we know that our mass incarceration system uh, is, is uh, overpopulated disproportionately with uh, people of color. And so this is yet another mechanism. Um, Robert, uh, Brett, uh, Brett Stevens in the New York Times, a rational conservative, if there ever was one, wrote that many of the provisions, he was looking at the Georgia law, and he said many of the provisions taken by themselves can be justified. 
that would, but he acknowledges, because he's a rational man, that the motivations are to tip the scales against, in particular, down there, black voters, urban voters, Democratic voters. Um, are motives relevant? Um, motives are uh, motives. Motives are definitely relevant. Um, let's just step back for a second and and, and just admit that um, there were actually some. Um, parts of the Georgia voting apparatus that did need to take a review after the past um, uh, after the past election, but it had nothing to do with the entire big lie that um, the Trump and the Republicans um, basically put out saying that they needed to they needed to fix. Um, they did need they they, they did need to, to to fix the the timing um, uh, the, the the timing of um, the 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 the, um, the run um, the runoffs um, so you didn't have uh, issues of it of the runoff uh, happening two months after the actual election and um, actually leaving Georgia for about um, uh, for about uh, three or four weeks um, with only uh, with only one senator because the the timing of the the timing of the runoff created a situation where. Um, David Perdue, who was the incumbent, the incumbent senator, uh, ended up leaving office on January 3rd. The runoff is on January 5th, and by the time um, the, the the count was all certified, um, Georgia really didn't have a, didn't have one senator for about for about two or three weeks. So you had weird quirks in there that that did need to be um, that did need to be addressed. Um, Certain individual things um, uh, you you can you can justify. Um, I personally uh, d d don't think in 2021 that um, that the requiring or re or asking voters to have to have a voter ID um, is is as much of a, a restriction as it may have been in the past. But that's something we you know that's something we can discuss. Uh, but I think the main issue, and you touched upon it at, at the beginning, that we do have to worry about is it's not necessarily about uh, uh, focusing on uh, uh, certain things like uh, um, where there are remote where, where there are remote um, um, voter voting boxes and things like that. The the big issue with they did in Georgia and we're seeing it in others in other states is is allowing state legislatures particularly obviously state legislatures that are a majority majority Republican to um, assert power from the the, the local um, the, the, the local counties and if basically setting up a situation that were 2024 to turn out in a number of states the same way that 20 uh, the 2020 did it would allow the legislatures to take over those the the, the, the local counting and uh, in certain cases give um, the um, give the count in the um, in in those in, in those uh, local districts um, over to say the Republicans as opposed to the, the Democrats uh, say in Fulton County in in, in Georgia, for uh, for example, and thus say swinging swinging all the electoral votes over to the to the Republican candidate. That is th that's where the issue. With, if you want to talk about um, um, Jim Crow or something like that, that's where the the real disenfranchisement um, worries uh, have to be looked at. Larry, um, motive. You know, well, motive, you know, drove a lot of the Voting Rights Act, which was the purpose of the preclearance that you could take steps that would be nominally defensible, but the but the Justice Department preclearance was precisely in order to uh, take a look at the motives of, of of changes that states areas covered, including again parts of Brooklyn, parts of the Bronx. Um, uh, the uh, Center for Law and Social Justice has been at the heart of voting rights fights, redistricting fights. How do you assess motive? How important is it to reenact these kinds of measures? I think one of the things we have to ask ourselves is not just what is the motive, but what is the impact and how are communities left to fare after the passage of these types of legislation. One might argue that voter ID is a perfectly benign uh, requirement. Everyone should have one. But when one realizes that the access to voter ID is inequitably distributed, uh, for example, where in states where uh, I believe it was Alabama, they said that you had to have an ID, but then they closed down all of the motor vehicles 
vehicle centers where you could secure an ID in predominantly black and brown communities. So uh, I, for me, I, I'm less almost interested in motive because it's, it's extremely difficult to prove than I am in the impact uh, that it's having on the voters. If we are finding that everyone has equal access to the ballot, and I say equal, not equitable, uh, but what we realize is that equal access to a ballot in a part of the state that is heavily, uh, that has a, it's, it's all of its needs met as it pertains to public transportation as compared to parts of the state that are completely only accessible to people who have cars. Well, if you live in that other part of the state, it doesn't matter what the motive is. I have equal access to the ballot technically, but I don't have equitable access to the ballot. It's not, there's no meaningful opportunity for me to actually engage in the process. And so I think that we have to ask, how are the voters faring under these systems? And if we're recognizing uh, that black voters, that Latinx voters, that Asian voters are being disenfranchised at rates that are disproportionate and that are exceeding what their white counterparts are experiencing, then that to me reeks of really what the, the four legs of the table of Jim Crow stood upon. And that was whether Jim Crow was in down south or up north, because we know that Jim Crow was active everywhere. And we're seeing exact reflections of that and what's happening with the, the more than 300 now voter suppression bills that have been uh, introduced into more than 40 states across this country. So even where in places like Texas, where population growth is being driven, by Latinx and Black communities in urban centers, once those data points increase the amount of seats that the state of Texas is going to have in the Congress, um, we are seeing that the legislature in the state of Texas is not distributing or allocating that power in any meaningful way to the populations that are actually driving the growth and are responsible for the increase in representation. So Jim Crow is an ever-present uh, friend and foe in this society, particularly as it pertains to what we're seeing right now. Can I, can I jump in here for a second? I'm sorry. Who was that? Uh, Nicole. Oh, go ahead. I mean, I was going to... I wanted to jump in on this because of the issue of motive. One of the frightening things about what's happening in Georgia is what they get, are giving themselves is, a, uh, is an opportunity for the legislature to take over up to four districts. It's not even... Um, oh, it, it's so overt what's happening because they didn't even say, well, we'll we, we can just go anywhere we want, up to four districts. And three of those four, I'm, I, I, I know, are predominantly black districts. I'm not sure about the fourth, but it's such a crazy, it's not some kind of coincidence. I mean, to me, the motive is on the face of the legislation. Um, and I think um, the other part of a lot of these laws that is so frustrating when you think of something, for example, as offensive, as you not being able and criminalizing the act of giving someone water on online and we know what's going to happen with the lines we've seen it over and over again where those lines are going to be because of lack of numbers of polling places and so forth but there is no no rational basis and no evidence no evidence that supports a reason for doing that and this is a, a, an idea that has sort of gotten lost in the fray here the courts have the opportunity to uh, to um, uh, to uh, uh, overrule uh, a uh, or rather to make uh, I'm sorry to, to invalidate um, a law passed by government that has no rational basis. And in the case of voting, the the the, the level is is even more uh, is even higher because it should have a compelling basis if you are diminishing people's right to exercise a fundamental vote like uh, a fundamental right like the right to vote. You know, Van, um, for students in the audience, the kind of the fights that we witnessed, experienced, took part in on voting rights, you know, the Voting Rights Act of 1964, I'm a little older than you. Um, it, it's kind of ancient history, but of course, it's modern history. I mean, what are the lessons? I mean, you know, you've written about what happened here in New York you know, kind of get to 1890 post, you know, reconstruction and you start to see the burgeoning of Jim Crow laws. Are there echoes today? Uh, the Voting Rights Act was actually 1965, by the way. It came after the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It was a one-two punch. Um, so this is what I think I would want students to really know, the hard truth, okay? It, it is, there is no clear constitutional basis for a right to vote in this country. I know there are some advocates who will say, well, you can find it in the 14th or it's assumed. I don't agree. Article one, section four of the US Constitution 
which is, is the guiding framework today, what the Supreme Court will cite, says, Article 1, Section 4, the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. So all of these Republicans, old white Democrat types turned Republicans, that's what they're talking about. That is their claim. And sometimes you hear in the background this line of, well, we're not actually a democracy, we're a republic, which is to say, who cares about majority rule, okay? So I, and I'm, I mean, I've been studying this for, I was much less aware of that guiding premise of the Constitution of Article 1, Section 4, 10 years ago or 20 years ago than I am now. They rely on that, okay? So do not think that there's some right to vote in this country, no. Now, so that's the first point that I wanna make. Um, the other point is just very quickly, other countries don't do this. All over the Americas, I have a colleague I sit at voter registration tables on, or election day tables with him at my college in Pennsylvania. He's from Argentina. And I remember him turning to me in 2016 and saying, what is it about you people? In Argentina, you're 18, you go get your national ID card. Everybody has a card. That's what you present to vote. It's simple. Argentina, you know, a country with lots of problems. In England, in France, in Japan, go around the world. Countries that claim to be electoral democracies do not. So we start with the Constitution, the total reservation to the states. The Voting Rights Act temporarily intervened in that and then was overturned, the most key parts of it in 2013. So I think the real issue that goes all the way back to 1789 is the question of who is a real American. The politics of the Republican Party today, and I know there'd be a bunch of those sort of, you know, New York County Republicans left over. I grew up with them. They've been pushed out by that billionaire Greek guy with the Greek name, right? The Roy Goodman Republicans. Remember them? The John Lindsay Republicans. They're all gone, okay? J J Javits, people like that. Okay, so that Republican Party is gone. It is dead as a doornail. These Jim Crow Republicans fully believe that they have a right to disfranchise people. And, you know, periodically you catch them on tape saying this. There's, nobody's got a right to vote if we can win an election because they believe that the real Americans are people who look like me. And at this point, their, their great gift to democracy was to say that if you were Irish or Italian or Polish, you get to be like me. And I am a, <laughs> all the way back, you know, my, one of my great, 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 great settled Schenectady way before America existed, before the English took this colony away from the Dutch. You know, that the Democratic Party was about saying people from Sicily and Galway were white like me. And that's as far as the Democratic Party got until Lyndon Johnson, effectively, right? So this is the situation we're in. So the last point I want to make that I want students to understand, this is about continuity. You got, we have to, people like us, people, I'm 63, we grew up this idea that the country had steadily advanced. First we had FDR, then we had Lyndon Johnson. Now we're kind of at this, like, it's, it's really being what it's supposed to be. No, that was a bump in the road. The deep continuity of American history is the existence of a white party. There has always been a white party in American politics. I mean that, a white party. The only time then you could say there really wasn't a white party was roughly maybe 1936 when the majority, but by no means all black voters switched over to the Democrats in 1936, but by no means all. Between then, and maybe 1965. That was the one point. And this is relevant to New Yorkers because you know who really understood that? Nelson Rockefeller. Rockefeller ran for president from 61 to 64 to the left of the Democrats. He was saying, I'm gonna pass these. He had a right to say it. New York Republicans had passed civil rights laws. That was the only time when you could look around and say there isn't one white party. And then the Republicans took up the banner of being the white party and kicked out all the moderates and liberals who we, if you're old enough, grew up with, right? So there's always been a white party. That's the continuity. The last point I want to make, uh, that you'll let me make, Bob, is the disfranchisement in this country. Please do not think that it's about some sort of deep ingrained racial feeling. Disfranchisement in this country has always been about power. I can take some votes away from you. Black men voted in New York from the 1790s until 1821 with actual real power. They actually controlled enough votes 
to send the New York County delegation, which could control the state assembly. The state assembly combined with the state Senate controlled by a country mile, the biggest pot of patronage in this country, 15,000 jobs in New York state under the direct control of a council of appointment that was appointed by the state legislature. That's five times as many patronage jobs as the federal government had. So black men were actually a balance of power and they were voting all over the state, but they really were. So Martin Van Buren, who's the evil genius of the Democratic Party, you know, while he was putting together Tammany Hall, putting it together, finally letting the Irish in because they disfranchised the Irish for decades, finally letting, letting them in. That was a violent process. The Irish pushing their way into Tammany Hall said, wait, it's just, you know, when, when all the slaves, the enslaved men are finally emancipated in 1828, there are going to be too many of them. There are going to be, I'd have to look at my book, 12% in Kings County, 15% in Rockland County. That's what the numbers would have been. And that, given that they were never going to vote for Van Buren's bucktails, let's disfranchise them. So disfranchisement, it looks, I mean, it is very racial, okay, because you go disfranchise specific groups of people based on a racial claim, but the motive is power. I, I just, I, I, if I could just quickly just jump, jump in there, um, Van, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you, uh, you know, reminded people of that, you know, 30, that 35, almost 40 year period where the, the parties were actually sort of kind of competitive. Yeah. I mean, uh, it may surprise a number of the students to, to realize that, um, that Richard Nixon got close to a, a third of the black vote um, yeah. in, in 1960. And that was, yeah. you know, that was the, la that was the last yeah. time um, that a re Republican president, uh, you know, um, did that. Um, did that well um, uh, yeah. in, uh, nationally, nas nationally, sp nationally speaking. Um, and I just wanted to say um, that conversation you were re relating with your uh, uh, Argentine um, colleague. Um, now, my background, as Bob as Bob knows, my background is is actually in Republican politics. I you know hmm. I, I worked on Capitol Hill um, for um, for Republicans in the in, in in the 90s, and I worked for the I worked for the for the RNC. So um, hmm. I'm not. I'm, I'm not the best person to give advice um, to um, to, Demo to Democrats. Um, maybe in the future, we'll see. Um, but I, I, I would I would argue um, that uh, in, in, instead of um, arguing over whether um, voter ID is a good idea, I would uh, uh, almost suggest that it might be a better the better argument might be. Um, Given that the Republicans have decided that, that voter ID is, is, is essential for voting, that they, they have, in a sense, given up the objections that the, the so-called limited government party once had to the idea of a national ID. Yeah. So I, I, think, I, I, I think the Democrats should start thinking about their uh, arguing, calling for a national ID for when, when people turn 18 um, is, is, a, is a better way to go than, than saying um, that the voter ID it's in and of itself is a bad idea. So while I agree with that statement that if this is the way we're going to go, then let's give everyone an ID. Uh, I think actually that, that would be a, a preferred way of, of resolving that issue. But I think what that masks is that voter ID is a pretext for voter suppression. And so we're not talking about people who are operating in good faith. We're talking about people who are specifically and intentionally and explicitly seeking to block black and brown people, non-white people from voting. Because that again is the way that power is distributed throughout this society. And I think we what we're seeing right now uh, with the big lie. No one was contesting Georgia voters. They were contesting black voters in Atlanta. Nobody was contesting Pennsylvania loader, voters. It was the black people in Philly and Pittsburgh. It wasn't Michigan that concerned the right. It was the black folks in Detroit who turned out and showed up and stayed in those lines and decided we were going to master the rules of voter suppression. And we were going to do so so well that we were going to overcompensate for the very strategic and surgical precision with which our votes were being targeted. So even if we were in good faith to suggest, yes, let's do a national voter ID. I think that's a far perfectly fine idea. That masks the fact that we are talking about people who are using that as a pretext to stop black and brown people from voting. And, and one of the reasons this is a, a great concern to me is because we've seen how this playbook rolls out before. We talked about the case of New York, but let's talk about the, the nation writ large. The 15th Amendment is passed. Black men, uh, nation 
nationwide begin to uh, embrace the vote. They take the options home to their families where they, the women in the community and, and the leaders in the community are determining how the community was going to vote because they weren't voting just for themselves. They were voting on behalf of the hopes and dreams of the formerly enslaved. And though we had the 15th Amendment, though we had uh, opportunities that opened up the franchise, what we saw was the undermining of that through the implementation of Black codes, which criminalized the very state of being Black. Once you have violated a Black code, which only Black people could violate, you are then arrested and sentenced to, to a prison term. And once you are sentenced to a prison term for the violation of, I don't know, five Black people being on a corner without a white person present, or laughing too loud in a way that was disruptive to white sensibilities, or uh, at being homeless, or, or not having employment because you had just been uh, removed from your plantation, which is the only home you had known, home, um, then you criminalize the very state of a Black person in that time. And then as a result of that criminalization, you're sentenced to three to five years for whatever it is you did to violate the Black codes. And then you have to serve out that time in, in, in slavery. So what we see is that every single time there is an advancement, we've had the 1964 Civil Rights Act was not the first time. That was Civil Rights Act 2.0, because we did that before in the 1800s. And so what I think we have to reconcile with is what's at heart of this issue is that this is a, it remains a slaveocracy. And the descendants of the beneficiaries of that slaveocracy are quite frankly determined, organized, and they know this system better than the rest of us because they created it to ensure that it is going to remain a slaveocracy in perpetuity, despite the fact that some of us have access to privilege and power. We will not have that as communities so long as we are dealing with the pretexts and not dealing with the ultimate issue. One of the issues of a national ID card, and it's kind of a broader issue of federalizing elections. One of the things that the John Lewis Act, that the, the idea of, you know, H.R. 1 and H.R. 4, which are the two voting rights bills in Congress, would federalize what has been a state function. I mean, you know, they, you know, traditionally Republicans, the small government Republicans said, we shouldn't, for, you know, we shouldn't federalize things except for things we care about. We should federalize abortion. We should federalize other issues. But things like um, you know, there's, there's no national driver's license. So um, is, this a, is this a state's rights issue or is it a state's right charade? Jump in. Well, we all know the history. <laughs> I, I think most of us know the history of the, the coded language of uh, states' rights and the use that that has been, that it has been put to, and it has mostly been um, uh, to racist use. And um, I just wanted to kind of follow up on, on something that Van was saying before about um, his friends, his Argentinian friend being so, you know, shocked about how uh, voting works and registration works in the United States. And, you know, it's easy to point out as well that the United States is an outlier in many regards. Um, we've set up a system that um, from, you can go back to the Federalist Papers and see this, we've set up a system that is very, very wary of mass participation. And so we've set up institutions that don't make it easy for people to participate. So, you know, there's voting and we don't make that easy. It's one day, you know, a Tuesday in November. Um, we, we don't have multiple days for voting, but there's other institutional problems as well. We're the only democracy that is only two parties and that raises, so we've got single member district first past the post. So it raises the stakes dramatically every time we redistrict, which is I say every time we, re, we gerrymander, we don't just redistrict, everybody gerrymanders. So every 10 years we gerrymander and the stakes are so high because you're talking about one representative from every district. And the two party system is not serving people of color well either. And so until we can figure out a system also to break up that duopoly that really only serves corporate interests ultimately, then we're, we're in trouble. Nicole, I mean, precisely a lot of the reforms in the city that you were intimately involved with were I mean, we're, a, you know, you know, we're such a one party city that factions within the Democratic Party, in essence, become multiple parties. And, and the essence of a lot of the, uh, the campaign finance reforms, the more recent rationalizing of Board of Elections procedures is, in fact, to make it easier to access that system. Is that a fair reading? I think it is. And I think going to the point earlier about um, 
about the two-party system. Um, one of the virtues of the way the City Campaign Finance Board was set up was to be nonpartisan and not bipartisan, which is the model in a lot of places. Uh, the theory being uh, supposedly that each party will watch out uh, uh, for against, you know, for any violations by the other party. But what really happens is that everybody wants to cheat, so they all let everything go by. And you have now a totally dysfunctional Federal Election Commission. I mean, it's, it's just beyond dysfunctional. Um, and uh, partly, I believe that has to do with the uh, sort of, uh, I don't know whether you say gentlemen's agreements anymore, but some kind of an agreement that um, sub Rosa that uh, we're all going to, you know, let uh, let things slide. And it's not about any principle. It's not about any uh, adhering to any law. It's just about you know, who, who gains from it. And if it's something uh, we both think we're going to gain from it one time or another, we're just not going to punish the other side when something bad happens. So um, I think what had, had happened in, in New York City, which I think is fine, again, was very laudable, was that uh, the system that was set up was a, a system with a tie-breaking mechanism and with a, a charge. Obviously, the members were going to be members of political parties and you have to limit how many could be from one party. But they were charged with operating in a nonpartisan manner. And when the tone was set for that at the very beginning, it has survived uh, for some decades now. So um, it, it, it's sort of a word that's gotten lost in all the discussion uh, and I think, by the way, the Georgia situation during the 2020 elections was sort of a, a mini, um, maybe a good moment, uh, if you want to call it that, when the state uh, officials were actually going to defend their, uh, their process, defend what they did for a living, that they did a good job, that you could look at it 16 times if you wanted, and you still got to get the same answer. Um, I don't, uh, I, I, I don't have any use. I mean, these are people who have been enforcing some very bad laws in the past, but they decided that their vote count was something that they stood behind. Um, and I think there's a version of that that you call, could call nonpartisan that is about just doing your job. Um, but we've lost that uh, in a lot of places now. Uh, let me go to Ernesto and see if we have a uh, question from the students. Uh, our first question today from a student is from Pamela Garcia of York College. With the significant setbacks in Georgia voting laws that were recently implemented, how can exclusion be combated and voting rights reformed when the issues are so deeply embedded in systemic policies? It's a, it's a very good question. I mean, the, you know, the odds are stacked against, you know, a, a lot of these legislatures, you have a supermajority, you know, you have you have one party rule. I mean, we have one party rule in New York, you know, in New York State. But a lot of these, how, where are the, absent the court, you know, and, you know, let me go to you, Van, absent a, um, an activist court, where are the levers to fight this? Our system is really, really, I, 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 was it Nicole or someone before pointed out, it's, it, it's, our system was set up to restrain the capacity of government to actually do things, you know, to maintain local and state control as much as possible. And I completely agree with Lurie. I mean, it, it, we call it a slaveholders republic after 1790 because many of these mechanisms, my friend David Waldstreicher wrote a famous book called Slavery's Constitution. They were to guarantee the rights. South Carolina was 70% black when the US was founded, right? Mm -hmm. It was to guarantee the rights of those people that the federal government would exist to suppress insurrections. That meant the insurrections of the enslaved. So we, we're stuck with what is essentially an 18th century document, which we have periodically revised in certain ways, but not in ways that, that can be, you know, I mean, we need to get rid of the electoral college. Okay, so pass the national voter compact that will end the electoral college. That would be one huge step. If someone said, you have, you know, George Soros's money to make something happen, pass the National Voter Compact. And that means winning state legislative majorities in Pennsylvania, which I know a lot about in some other key states. But we could do it. We could get from whatever it is, 191 to 270, right? Um, so that's the National Voter Compact would end the Electoral College. We've still got the Senate, which would allow an extraordinarily small percentage of the actual number of people in this country to govern the rest of us. Last time I calculated, you could control the Senate with the filibuster with 16% of the population, 40 senators representing 16%. How we get around that, um, 
I'm sorry, Bob, all I can say is we have to ruthlessly pursue political power. And we're seeing an advance and, you know, under Biden, the Democrats are acting like a party that actually wants to govern instead of rolling over and putting its feet in the air and asking to be, have its belly padded like in 2009, if you pardon that disgusting metaphor, okay? They're, you know, they should take every 51, 49, 51, 50 vote they can. Well, let, but, me, let, me just, yeah. let me just build on that because I think that, you know, my, my analysis of Biden is that he's essentially changed a 40 year old paradigm yeah. you know, rolled in by Ronald Reagan which said government is the problem by saying government can solve things. Government can do things. And he wants to reach out, but he's not going to be stopped from reaching out. And part of this is that the traditional middle where things were resolved has disappeared, yeah. whether it's because of, because of the internet, because of technological advances, because we, we spend a lot more time in silos where we agree with each other as opposed to the middle ground where we can fight things out. I mean, Robert, you've looked at this stuff. You've been an editorial writer for, for, for an awful long time. Is any of this possible absent finding some middle ground? No, I mean, I think, I mean, I think you, know, um, you know, Van's point is, is right that um, uh, we're at a point really now where um, the only thing that power uh, respects is, 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 is power. Um, and uh, it, it, Dem Democrats, uh, some, some of my uh, some of my Republican or former Republican friends, um, we, we, we'll, we'll chat about what's going on in, in, in certain cases, and we'll you know we'll pull out whatever little hair we might have in our heads and say you know why why do um, why do why do Democrats get queasy about exercising exercising power? Um, I mean, we saw in we you know we saw over between um, 2016 and 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 20 and 2020 when Republicans, if they had the power to block a Supreme Court um, nomination, they took it, and if they had the power to push through a uh, a Supreme Court nomination, um, they took they took it. Meanwhile, uh, Democrats are cavilling over, you know, whether whether they should um, expand the court, which I think is a better phrase than than pack the than, than pack the court. I mean, it, 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 the, the 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 problem is, the um, uh, Republicans believe in power and they'll exercise and they and they'll exercise that power. Um, the Democrats believe. They believe in rules and believe in precedent, and because they believe in rules and precedent, that that um, that hampers them in um, in the in the exercising in the in the exercising of power. Um, expanding of courts is a um, is is it's a statute. It's a statute um, that goes back uh, to uh, 1869, basically. the The last time the the the, the, the court was expanded and and shrunk. Was was done by Republic, Republicans to block, uh, in fairly, a really awful Democratic president Andrew Johnson um, from from adding members. But they but they, they 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 cut the court down to seven. Then they brought it back up to nine once once Johnson once Johnson was once Johnson was gone. There's nothing really stopping um, Democrats from doing that, except from the idea that they that, 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 except for the fear that well, obviously there's Joe Manchin doesn't want to do it, but putting that aside. If they were able to get the 50 votes plus Kamala Harris, they would, they could um, add, they could add to the court if they wanted to. But they would be kind of nervous about, you know, offending the sensibilities of the New York Times editorial board. Which I think is why it's so important. Because even that question, which was such a great question, but it's not just Georgia that we have to worry about. Georgia was just step one. We are seeing these same types of voter uh, suppression bills uh, introduced in, and I think my last count was at over 40 states across the country and they are moving forward. It's a, it's a very ALEC-like approach. It's a copy and paste of suppression. You, you insert it into one legislation, it passes, wonderful. We copy and paste and we distribute throughout the country. And I think that this is really going to continue to be the paradigm until Americans, people who are most impacted by this, take to the streets for a sustained engagement on, on civil actions that are going to make voting rights a federal issue. We, Joe Manchin does not represent anyone in the state of New York. 
But I, on my radio show, I'm now asking people to call Joe Manson and, and Kristen Cinema, who are blocking uh, the, the, the adjustments or the amendments to the filibuster, to ask them, why is it that you are in favor of legislation that's anti-Black? Why is it that you are in favor of supporting legislators who seek to return to Jim Crow voting? Why is it that you are in favor of preserving Jim Crow hate crimes level of policing by not allowing the Democrats to press forward with passing the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act? We have to start speaking very clearly and specifically and openly about what is happening. And I am no longer interested in who's a Democrat or who's a Republican. I'm interested in who is committed to ensuring that I will have the right to raise my children uh, with my husband and hope that he does not get shot on his way back running at the park. So I, I'm, I'm feeling as though what we saw last year with the sustained protest that came about as a result of what we saw happening to George Floyd, we are going to have to have that level of engagement because not only do they own enough legislatures to make this happen, I know I personally do not have the capacity to spend the next 70 years, calendar notwithstanding, in the nadir of post-reconstruction the devastation that Black communities experienced after slavery, which many considered worse than slavery. And in many respects, what we are looking at is a return, not just to Jim Crow, that's very polite sounding, we're looking at a return to the racial slaveocracy in real time. And we are going to have to have people who are willing to say, I know this is a, it's annoying to protest. I'm not a fan of having to go out into the streets, but frankly, if that is the only thing that is going to push the needle and move us forward, then that's what it's going to have to take. Otherwise, we are looking, we're literally in the middle of history repeating itself at this very moment. And I just don't know that the country can sustain itself on this vein. And I, and I don't know that we have it in us to have another civil war. So the, re, the other option is, we return to what we were starting as, and that to me is untenable, absolutely untenable. Um, let me go to a second question with Ernesto. Our second question today comes from Wayne Dawkins of your college. When we fight for voting rights, are we also fighting for voters to be educated on the issues they vote on? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, if anybody, you know, you know anybody can vote and anybody does vote, I mean, the, an informed vote you know, you don't, there's no literacy requirement, you know, you know, literacy narrowly defined, not literacy as you had in the South where a black PhD couldn't pass, but an illiterate white person could pass. Um, um, is this, I mean, is there hope out there? I mean, we're all, you know, I mean, a lot of this is, uh, you know, how much of this is driven by a focus on identity as opposed to a focus on class. There's some very broad, I mean, Lyndon Johnson, one of them, you know, very famously said that the purpose, you know, that, you know, that, that the purpose of restrictive laws is, is to convince a poor white man that if a black man gets something, that's going to be worse off for you. That, you know, I mean, it was, it was kind of a raw racial calculation where he also said when the Civil Rights Act and the um, and the Voting Rights Act were passed, that the Democrats have lost the South for a generation. And I think the, I th uh, to, 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 the um, to the students' um, question, um, the, 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 the attack um, on, on voting rights, which is, as we said, uh, comes out um, from, this, from, the, from the big lie impulse, is in a sense, um, arguably part one of ways to try and figure out, uh, as, as Van said, this is about power and to to disenfranchise the 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 voting power of the of the party that's voting against um, that's that's voting against Republicans. And the, the, there will be, I believe, the coming it, coming down the road in a number of these states, um, uh, some version some version of of of, of literacy of, of literacy tests. Mm -hmm. Um, if you if you go on if you if you go on social social media, you start see, you start seeing um, individuals um, who have large um, large right of center right of center followings you know five hundred thousand you know five hundred thousand followers and things like that uh, talk about um, uh, th that cer that that certain people um, you know. Uh, don't know the issues and why should those people be voting? And you had a, um, um, I think it was an Arizona Republican legislator who said, well, we should talk, we should be talking less about the quantity of voters and the quality 
of, of, of voters. And it's not just an, an idea, a question of making the assumption of, you know, oh, well, it, black, the black voters, they're just talking about certain individuals who, because they aren't voting the way that um, a Republican wants to, to vote, they should try and figure out a way to prevent them, um, um, prevent them, prevent them from voting. So yeah, I, I do think that we do have to start being wary about the idea. I mean, look, I'll be, I'll be candid. You know, there, there are a number of, uh, there are a number of MAGA voters out there who I don't think um, uh, know the issues, and I don't think that they should, they should be, they should be voting. Um, but I'm humble enough to know that my preferences, you know, shouldn't be. Um, uh, shouldn't be what we what guide us in de 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 determining who gets to the polls. Um, unfortunately, there are those on the other side who don't uh, quite have that uh, uh, sense of magnet magnanimity. I want anybody, uh, Nicole. You want to jump in on this? I just want to. I want to make sure I get everybody involved in this. Yeah. Well, I mean, the issue of educating voters is a very complex. One uh, in New York City, uh, just to tap that another time. We had uh, uh, the campaign finance board has issued voter uh, guides that go to every registered voter. It used to go by mail. Now they do it online, of course. That gave every candidate a page to talk about uh, the issues and uh, uh, attempted to describe um, the more complex uh, issues of charter revision and so on. And yeah, it is, it is really important. I mean, the problem as always is going to be how do you measure such a thing? And then are you going to, uh, uh, will it be measured fairly? And you know the answer to that is no. So uh, it's not the kind of thing I think that you can uh, legislate at all. But what you can do is make, make the information available. Uh, you can you know, have debates, you can have uh, documents that go out. Um, and you do have to have, I mean, I think one of the amazing things that happened that makes me so angry about Twitter is that once Twitter shut Donald Trump off, he was kind of gone, comparatively speaking. And if they had done that earlier, you know, maybe maybe January 6th would never have happened at all. I mean, it was such a powerful uh, avenue, and it's a, a disinformation avenue, and, and that's 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 the challenge now is how are we going to meet that, uh, especially through the social media. I would also add that when it comes to education for voters, it depends on what community you're talking about. When we are talking about, for example, communities of African descent who only got access to the ballot in the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which means we've literally known how to access the system for 57 years. So uh, Van, you, you, I believe you said you were 60 years old. You're older than integration. So when we're thinking about it, when we frame it in that way, um, the reality is getting the right to register to vote is different than understanding how committees are formed, how power and, and legislators are actually forced to, to react when, or, or interact with each other when they're in state houses and halls of government, how budgets are, are put together, how you get money from one pot into another pot. What are the rules for who's supposed to have preference or, or priority with, with power and leadership? These are all things that took the 347 years before 1965, where white people were creating these rules and these systems and these structures and intentionally killing us for trying to access it. So when we're talking about voting, we're not talking about equal or voter education. We're not talking about equal communities. We're talking about communities that have been intentionally disempowered and intentionally maintained in a state of ignorance and excluded from understanding the inner workings of government. We see this reflected in the state, uh, in our own state legislature, where you have a massive influx of, of, of elected officials of color who are now able to wield power differently than the first batch of black elected officials who took power in this state. And so when we're talking to people who are doing this work on the ground, I can't go into a classroom of, of black and brown kids and say everyone should vote because it's your duty. I got to ask them, what is upsetting you about your community? How angry, what is making you angry? And then connect that to how the vote distributes power and resources that can help them solve it. So I start often with the prison industrial complex because that's always a winner in a really bad way. But what are, you, what are your concerns about the criminal justice process? And, and when they know, when we've discussed all of that, then we can point to the structures that exist that determine who is, what types of policies in the criminal justice process are going to be implemented in their community. So when they know a DA is elected, 
when they know that the person who chooses the police commissioner is elected, that's a very different level of interest in what the vote means because it is tied to their everyday life. When we talk about access to food, access to housing, and when you start these conversations about voter education on what is already happening in the lives of the people that you're talking to, then find ways to connect those issues to electoral turnout. When we know that if half of our community did not vote for mayor and the mayor's picking the commissioner, that's a real motivator to get the other half of the community to turn out in the next election. Hey, no, let me ask this, you, uh, you referenced criminal justice issues in, in your opening comments. And you know, in terms of expanding, we have a tradition, an imperfect tradition of expanding the uh, franchise in this city. We just saw parolees. Uh, you know, there was just a bill passed through the legislature to give parolees the right to vote. If you're in prison, you can't vote. There's an issue of where you're counted. The upstate counties want you to be counted for re for reapportionment up there. You know, even though even though you're from down here, but you know. Is there any answer other than making good than making good trouble? I mean, you can't give up. You got to keep fighting. People are throwing roadblocks in your way. You just got to keep knocking them out. It's there's no there's no magic, you know. There's no magic switch, you know, a switch to throw. Well, and again, if we really wanted um, mass participation, which I think we've established that we don't want that. That's not the way institutionally we've set up um, the American project. Um, but if we wanted it, we would have civics and citizenship teach in high school, and we would actually teach real history, particularly real American history. For those of us who uh, uh, teach in colleges for a living, um, and especially those of us who teach about race, um, it's it's quite clear. You know, I, I have students all the time who are just angry. Um, Laurie was uh, talking about con the convict lease system before. I teach that in my race and mass incarceration class and students have never heard of it, of course. And they're so angry about the, uh, after reconstruction, about the elimination of funding for black schools and about the convict lease system itself. And many of them, when they learn about these things, then have some kind of agency for how to direct their efforts. And we're not going to have these mass movements that I agree we absolutely need until there is a kind of collective um, consciousness raising in some sense. And that's going to be partly uh, in the hand with young people to really get them to understand how power works and how racial hierarchies work and reinvent themselves over and over. But you seem to be I mean, I think this whole discussion is that that lesson of how power and hierarchy works comes out of the Trump, you know, protest over the election that, you know, what, uh, you know, what Robert's calling the big lie that he was cheated out of the election, that somehow, you know, the wrong people voted, that you counted too many. That seems to have coalesced a moment. So, I mean, is this a time when that kind of mass movement can take place? Is, the, is this a time, you know, from this kind of, does this ferment generate hope? Or am I being too uh, Pollyanna-ish or to, to coin a phrase? I mean, anybody jump in on that, you know, uh, Lurie, you, you know, you're dealing with, you're dealing with people at Medu Evers. Is it, does it seem insurmountable? Does it seem it's time, you know, it's time to make good trouble to quote John Lewis? Well, I think it's always time to make good trouble. Uh, but I will confess that as someone who has a fairly decent understanding of the cycles that this nation's history is founded on, I would be lying if I didn't say my husband and I are considering options outside of the country because we just don't know. And, and frankly, I, I think we're at a, another one of the inflection points for many people of African descent in this country. When you look at, frankly, the militarization of white nationalism right now, when you look at the fact that not only are they introducing hundreds of voter suppression bills to make sure we never do what we did in 2020, because it was, again, it wasn't just the black votes. It was black voters, Latinx voters, Asian American voters, particularly in Georgia, who flex their collective muscles. Um, we got to ask ourselves, is this doable? Is it doable in a meaningful way that 
will really produce results that don't have my community members constantly struggling to remove the slave label. And, and this is not the first time these questions have been posed. It's not the first time these conversations have happened. If you ever get a chance to watch the movie, The Book of Negroes, which I highly recommend, uh, you'll see they were having these conversations before the Revolutionary War. When Britain and America were going to blows, Black people were like, yo, should we hook up with the Brits? Because we might be able to get this whole thing done like real quick, fast, in a hurry. So these are questions we have to ask. And, and the idea that right now we have not just muskets, but we've got AR-15s in the hands of anybody who wants to buy it or print it on a 3D computer or 3D printer. We've got people breaking into the Capitol. And from all evidence that has been released thus far with very high levels of help and support all up and down the chain of authority, not just from the legislators, but from the military, from the, the, arm, the, the armed forces of this nation. When the FBI, it was telling us as early as 2006, that the military services and police precincts all across the country were hotbed breeding grounds for training for white nationalists. We have to be honest about the fact that not only are they doing voter suppression mass law massively, they're also now criminalizing protest. They're literally introducing bills that say angry white people can drive, and I'm saying white because we know if a black person does it, you're going to jail. Angry white people can drive into crowds of protesters if they fear, feel threatened. How many officers have we heard say, I feared for my life when they have the weapon and the black person doesn't? So we see how this trend is going. So I, I'm hopeful that education can help. I just don't know if I'm still as hopeful that this country can be saved from itself. Van, I'm, I'm going to give you 20 seconds to sum up. How's that? How's that for an offer? I, th I think we just step back from an abyss. I think the notion that everything is okay now is incredibly dangerous. I think if Donald Trump had you know, stolen an, an election, that we would be looking at something where, where democracy would be the merest facade, you know, the New York Times could still publish, but we would have entered a full on authoritarian regime powered by white nationalism with distinct fascist tendencies, let's put it that way. But I'll sum it up in two words, what I'm worried about, I'm worried about Patrick Lynch, the head of the PBA, because if we go in that direction, it's going to be people like Patrick Lynch, who take us towards something that looks like fascism, people who control armed force, well, let me uh, thank everybody. That's a not so lovely note to end on. Um, let me thank everybody for all you know, all five of you. Thank you for the questions in the students' audience. Uh, this is a this is an issue that's not going away. You know, I think good. I think good trouble is the answer. I, with all due respect to Larie, can't give up yet. And we will see you next time on CUNY Forum. Thank you all.